The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at peerview.com forward slash ESW 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello and welcome to Taking the Fight to AML, Oncology Nurse Perspectives, Principles and Practice in an Era of Innovative Therapies. I'm Laura Zatella, a nurse practitioner from the University of California, San Francisco. I'm pleased to welcome my colleague, Stephanie Rodriguez, also a nurse practitioner from University of California, San Francisco, to our panel discussion. During this presentation, we'll focus on the important role of the nurse in caring for AML patients after the approval of multiple newer treatment options, and we'll use a case-based format to provide guidance on best practices for nurse professionals. Today's agenda will be reviewing case-based sessions on AML care covering upfront treatment choices in high-risk and mutation-defined disease, options for post-remission therapy, and symptom management and supportive care strategies for all of the new medications that we have to treat patients with AML. As we get started today, I want to talk a little bit about some background of AML. We know that AML is the most common acute leukemia, accounting for nearly 20,000 cases and over 11,000 deaths in 2020. We know that AML is a disease that primarily affects older adults, also knowing that older adults generally have lower rates of complete remission, increased relapse rates, decreased survival, and an increased treatment-related morbidity and mortality. We also know that older, older adults with AML tend to generally be undertreated when we're approaching their disease. In order to really understand where AML is today, I think it's important to really provide a framework of where AML was pre-2017. So prior to 2017, AML was really designed or really defined by two main um, treatment pathways. It was really about determining whether or not a patient was fit to receive intensive chemotherapy which in general was a seven plus three backbone, which had been largely unchanged for the previous 40 years. And then using a combination of history, genetics, history and genetics, which was primarily chromosomal data, patients were stratified by their risk and put into categories of either favorable, intermediate, or unfavorable risk. And these risk groups determined whether their curative approach was based solely on chemotherapy or if they were steered towards an allogeneic stem cell transplant. The intermediate risk group remained a largely gray area with an unclear treatment choices about whether to pursue transplant versus curative chemotherapy. In patients who were not deemed to be unfit for intensive chemotherapy, they were, uh, their choices were much more limited and often included consideration of clinical trials, hypomethylating agents, and then best supportive care or hospice. However, after 2017, the approval of a large number of new drugs for AML really changed the treatment landscape. And uh, treatment choices really became largely based on molecular markers that better characterized diseases at diagnosis. Molecular markers such as FLT3, IDH, whether they had treatment-related AML, or again, their age and fitness status really became the primary determining factors in how we approached treatment for these patients. And then using these new markers, we were able to better uh, describe which patients fell into these favorable, adverse, or intermediate risk groups, which helped us to better determine which therapeutic choices were best in determining our approach for treating these patients. So another aspect of AML care that we wanted to discuss today was integrating palliative care, symptom management, and appropriate supportive care. AML, the diagnosis of AML is a devastating diagnosis and often patients present um, very ill with low blood counts um, and other symptoms. During the course of their therapy, the treatment can be very intense with a multitude of different side effects and it requires um, the entire team, nursing team, advanced practice providers and physicians, social workers, dietitians, um, to help manage all of the symptoms. Some interesting research that um, has been done over the last couple years was 
uh, looking at how patients might benefit if we introduced palliative care early in the disease course. We know in other cancers that has made a significant difference. And in leukemia, uh, the same thing was observed. So in one study that was um, presented at ASCO in 2020, patients with AML receiving intensive chemotherapy in the hospital were noted to have a substantial decline in their quality of life and their mood. But integrating palliative care into their treatment, um, into their treatment plan led to substantial improvements in their quality of life, psychological distress, and end-of-life care. So likewise, there was another multi-site randomized trial of concurrent palliative care versus usual care that was presented at 2021 ASCO. And in this case, patients who were hospitalized for leukemia during their initial hospitalization as well as any subsequent hospitalization received twice a week visits from palliative care specialists. And these interventions focused on symptom management, psychological support, coping, and building rapport. This resulted, not surprisingly, in improved quality of life, decreased anxiety, and decreased depression for the patients. In addition, um, and particularly significant, they noted that the patients learned better coping skills, and patients were more likely to have an approach-oriented coping versus um, a avoidant-oriented coping. They also noticed that patients were more likely to have advanced care planning and less chemo at end of life. And this is a really significant issue because historically it has been really difficult to incorporate palliative care into hematologic malignancy. And at the end of life, it's been really difficult to um, utilize hospice care. And one of the primary barriers to utilizing hospice care is that um, patients with leukemia tend to benefit from transfusions at the end of life. And transfusions are often not part of hospice care. And so patients haven't been able to get to hospice because of this need for transfusion. And this has been something that, um, you know, that, that we have been trying to address. Um, Stephanie, I think you have had a lot of experience with this in, in your practice. Um, what is your, what has your experience been with end of life care and hospice with your patients with leukemia? I mean, Laura, I agree with this 1000%. I think this has been a really challenging piece of our practice. Um, sort of, as you mentioned, many of these patients are transfusion dependent at the end of their life. So a decision to transition into hospice is really a decision to end transfusions. We even um, refer to this within our practice as the transfusion tether that really keeps patients coming in for active treatment or active transfusions rather than transitioning to hospice. Um, in our practice, we have found that really early integration of palliative care, even at times when we still have a curative intent with treating these patients, has really helped us um, sort of lay the framework for some of these conversations. So the patients have had a lot of these conversations um, before we get to the point in their decision making where we're really talking about hospice. Yeah, and we've even identified one agency that will allow transfusions for up to six weeks. And that has been a really nice transition for patients because it's very scary uh, for them to be coming into the clinic two or three times a week sometimes for care and then to suddenly um, be at home with, 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 without you know, seeing a provider. So when they know that they can get their transfusions, that makes them feel more comfortable and then more work can be done towards um, you know, helping them um, at the end of life. So let's move on to uh, our first case, which is Mary. And Mary is a patient that Stephanie and I um, are taking care of at UCSF. She's a 53-year-old woman with FLT3 AML. She presented with fatigue, night sweats, and myalgias. She has an excellent performance status, and her bone marrow biopsy showed 32% blast with a FLT3 IDT mutation. So um, what are the treatment options for for Mary, um, given that she is fit for intensive therapy. So this is something that we've talked a little bit about, Laura, sort of what do we want to consider in a newly diagnosed patient before we sort of choose an avenue with which we're going to treat them. And things that we've spoken about, um, which even though we already know based on this case that Mary is fit for intensive therapy, 
But I think we really want to know sort of both uh, what the patient's performance status and level of fitness is. I think we also want to know sort of what their um, social background is and how much support that they have at home. And maybe determining up front whether transplant is something that they're going to be interested in or would really have the support in order to be able to go through something like that. So I think those are decision um, factors that we really want to be considering before we present treatment options to our patients and when um, and sort of things that we want to be discussing with them as we're trying to figure out which avenue to go down. Yeah, absolutely. And then of course, um, there's several decision points along the way at initial, diag initial diagnosis, after achieving remission, deciding post-remission therapy. So we're constantly reevaluating and having uh, these conversations. In general, when you have a patient who's newly diagnosed who are fit for intensive therapy, the treatment alg algorithm has not changed that significantly. So overall, the concept is um, to use an induction chemotherapy to suppress the malignant clone and achieve a complete remission. And then we know once patients have a complete remission, if they don't have any further therapy, they will inevitably relapse. So they need some sort of post-remission consolidation therapy, and historically that has been with um, high-dose cytarabine or allogeneic transplant if a donor is available and if a patient um, can undergo transplantation. So for induction therapy, the standard is still seven plus three, um, which Stephanie mentioned earlier, has been the standard of care for um, intensive therapy of AML for over 40 years. There are some variations with some of the new medications. So if a patient has favorable cytogenetics, um, meaning that they are likely to have a good response to chemotherapy, they can have a standard induction with seven plus three. And if, it's, if the leukemia is CD33 positive, consider using um, gemtuzumab in addition to that, followed by post-remission therapy with HIDAC. And these patients may not necessarily need to have an allogeneic transplant because with these favorable cytogenetics, they have a good chance of response and long-term overall survival with chemotherapy. Now, if our patients have intermediate or adverse cytogenetics, these are patients where um, allotransplant is really considered um, the only curative therapy. And again, you use standard induction, and if there's a FLT3 mutation, um, consider adding mitostorin, which is a FLT3 inhibitor, in order to improve um, the treatment response. The newest agent to this initial treatment regimen is liposomal donorubicin and cytarabine. And this is indicated for secondary AML in patients age 60 to 75, and it can be used for induction as well as post-remission therapy. And patients who receive liposomal donorubicin and cytarabine can also go on to um, an allogeneic transplant if they are, um, are fit for allotransplant. Stephanie, when you have patients that are diagnosed with FLT3 mutant AML, how do you um, educate them and explain to them what that means? So I think when a patient is newly diagnosed with FLT3 positive AML, you sort of want to take the time to let them know what this marker really means for them in the course of their treatment. I like to tell them things like it often means that they will be diagnosed with a higher white blood cell count. And I think it is an important part of the conversation for them to know that, uh, that this marker does mean that they have a worse prognosis and a higher rate of relapse. However, I also really like to frame that with an um, information that there are drugs that are targeted towards this specific mutation so that we do have tools in our kit to help us treat their leukemia that we wouldn't have if they didn't have this particular molecular marker. I think it's also important for patients to know that this, um, that this mutation can occur across, across several different subtypes of AML. So really, um, there's a lot to really share with patients here, but I think the real take home points is that they should understand that this is a worse prognostic factor, but that they should also know that there are treatments that are targeted for this particular mutation. Yeah, exactly. And one of those, um, one of the FLT3 inhibitors that is indicated for use um, in, with intensive chemotherapy is mitostorin. And I do reassure them and tell them that mitostorin is generally very well, well tolerated. 
in fact, um, in the clinical trials, they only saw rash and anemia a little bit more common than placebo. So most patients tolerate mitostorin well, and it increases uh, their overall treatment response. It is moderately emetogenic, so it's important to use pre-medication with an anti-emetic. Um, it's also important for us to keep in mind that it can cause QTC prolongation, and our patients are often on mul multiple medications that cause QTC prolongation, and that's an important thing um, to monitor for. The rash is mild, can be treated symptomatically, and then um, we also monitor a liver function test as well. So Mary, our patient with FLT3 positive um, AML, initially received 7 plus 3 induction and mitostorone, which is dosed at 50 milligrams twice a day on days 8 through 22, according to the ratified trial design. And what is nice about this um, dosing strategy is that often you don't get molecular testing back for a couple days, um, and if patients start chemotherapy on day one, and a couple days later you get the molecular testing back and it shows that there's a FLT3 mutation, you can start mitostorin on day eight. In Mary's case, her marrow upon count recovery showed remission, and she went on to receive post-remission therapy with high-dose cytarabine and mitostorin, which is also given in the post-remission setting. Following um, post-remission therapy, she had an allogeneic hematopoietic transplant. And then after transplant, we needed to talk about what the options were for maintenance, because uh, we know that patients who have leukemia that has the FLT3 mutation are at higher risk of relapse. And so a post-transplant maintenance um, may help prolong overall survival. So Laura, I have a question for you about this case, because it feels like we covered a lot of ground here from her induction all the way through transplant and now onto maintenance. And I'm wondering what the role of the, what you see is the role of the nurse in counseling patients on post-remission therapy from allotransplant to maintenance. I know in my experience, some of these patients, um, even if they've been consented um, ahead of transplant about the possibility of maintenance therapy, sometimes feel surprised by it by we, when we talk to them around um, day 60 or so when we're thinking of starting treatment. So I'm wondering how you think the nurse can be helpful in this scenario. That's an excellent question, Stephanie. Um, I do spend a lot of time talking to patients about maintenance therapy, especially after allo transplant. Typically, we like to start maintenance therapy um, sooner rather than later after the transplant. And often patients still aren't feeling well and sometimes have concerns about starting a new medication or adding another medication to their already lengthy uh, medication list. So I talk about how Using a FLT3 inhibitor will significantly decrease the chance of the leukemia coming back and, um, and then talk about the different options that we have. So one option for one FLT3 inhibitor that we have is mitostorin, which we've already talked about, um, where we have data that shows that adding mitostorin to 7 plus 3 improves overall survival. There's another FLT3 inhibitor called um, gilteritinib, and this is approved in the refractory and relapse setting, but we know it has activity um, against split three, and there are ongoing studies looking at it in other settings. But in the re refractory and relapse setting, it showed improvement in overall survival versus chemotherapy. Um, Quasartinib is approved in Japan, is not yet approved um, in the United States. And then the fourth agent is serafinib. And serafinib um, has excellent data. Um, there was a trial called the SORMAIN trial, and that showed that serafinib maintenance after um, hematopoietic cell transplantation improved relapse-free survival and overall survival. So in general, um, there are a number of different side effects that, that patients might have. So I talked to them about nausea and using antiemetics um, to prevent nausea or to treat it if they have it. Sometimes patients will have some diarrhea and that usually be, can be managed with loperamide. Um, we also see skin rashes, especially with the serapinib and patients can use emollients or topical steroids um, for that. Fatigue um, is definitely a possibility. And then um, there's also drug to drug interactions. So there can be interactions with azoles, and most of our patients are on posaconazole or another um, azole to prevent fungal infections. 
Um, it, and again, the issue of QTC prolongation, uh, which we need to monitor. And then lastly, there's compliance and making sure that the patient is actually taking their medication because we know that medications um, will definitely not work if the patient's not actually taking them. So Stephanie, um, Mary, our 53-year-old woman who um, has AML that is split three positive, um, you know, both you and I were involved with her care and we started her on serafinib and she unfortunately had um, significant toxicity to it. So after we started it, she had nausea. We were able to control it pretty well using ondansetron during the day and olanzapine at night before she went to bed. She had diarrhea and it was controlled with loperamide. But I think the most profound thing was the rash that um, she had. And in, this, in the picture in the slides, um, her skin is actually a, a light brown and she developed this very, very dark brown, hyperpigmented rash. And um, her legs, she described them, they were swollen and taut, and she described it this burning pain. Um, and we tried treating it symptomatically with triamcinolone ointment, um, but it didn't get much better. And one day she came in with a package insert and she said she had it all circled. And she said, Laura, I have every single one of these side effects. <laughs> and we ended up um, discontinuing it for intolerance. And at this point, we had to think about what to do, um, and we started gilteritinib. Gilteritinib is not approved in this setting, um, but it has activity against split three. And in, a, in, in the case where she was not tolerant um, to serafinib, we thought it was a reasonable thing to do off label. Um, but Stephanie, can you talk to us a little bit about? The other things we considered, because she had a lot of skin changes that were really tricky to figure out. Yeah, I think, Laura, that you hit really nicely um, just on the fact that nothing is ever really straightforward in these cases. Um, in the setting of this current education that we're giving on FLT3 inhibitors, it's very easy to determine that her new symptoms that started right after she began serafinib were likely from her FLT3 inhibitor. But the reality is that after allogeneic stem cell transplant, Patients are really experiencing a constellation of other symptoms, so it can be hard to tease out what the actual cause is that's affecting them. In this patient, when she came out of the hospital, she also had significant skin toxicity from her transplant preparative regimen. And then of course, in any transplant patient that develops nausea, vomiting, and a rash, you always have to have graft versus host disease on your differential. Um, in this pa particular patient, I think um, really taking a careful history and really noting that all of these symptoms really started right after her serafinib had started, that it seemed like the safest thing to do to immediately stop her FLT3 inhibitor in order to see when, whether any of these symptoms actually improved. And in fact, many of these things did improve quite quickly after stopping the serafinib. Would you agree, Laura? Yeah, and I think the other... Um... The other aspect of the rash um, that made us think it was serafinib, in addition to the timing, was the fact that it, it was localized only to the, like from the knee down to the feet. And graft versus host disease tends to start in the torso or the arm, so I think it was off the, the distribution of it. And the fact that it, it was burning was also really unusual. Right, it didn't quite fit the pattern that we were expecting. And certainly stopping the serafinib was the right place to start in terms of treating the rash. So then we started um, gilteritinib. And when you start patients on gilteritinib, um, it's really important to get labs. Uh, a CBC and a comprehensive metabolic panel is recommended um, and also a creatinine phosphokinase. And these are labs that we usually obtain prior to gilteritinib, and then at least once a week for the first month, once every two weeks for the second month, and then at least once a month for the duration of therapy. And part of the reason why um, we have to check these labs so often is because one of the biggest things with gilteritinib is myelosuppression. So we do see anemia, thrombocytopenia, and neutropenia, and that needs to be um, monitored for. Um, other less frequent side effects include liver toxicity, including transaminitis, 
and QTC prolongation. So again, um, starting, starting gilteritinib, um, I would recommend getting an e EKG prior to initiation of treatment, and then also on days 8 and 15 of the first cycle and prior to the start of the um, next two cycles. And then, of course, try to avoid other QTC prolonging drugs. Um, but again, our patients are on a lot of medications that prolong the QTC, inclu including many of our antiemetics. Another um, important side effect to know about, but fortunately very rare, is differentiation syndrome. And differentiation syndrome can occur as early as two days after you start the gilteritinib, or it could be up to 75 days after initiation. And so this is an important um, side effect to counsel patients about because once they've been on a medication for let's say four or six weeks, if they develop new symptoms, they might not necessarily correlate that with, um, with the medication that they think they've been taking for weeks without any problem. So some of the signs of differentiation syn um, syndrome, syndrome are cough, fever, and so I make sure patients know that they should report any new um, cough or dry cough or difficulty breathing um, or new edema. And if recognized early, this can be treated um, very successfully with steroids. And then lastly, um, there are uh, drug interactions uh, which need to be taken into account, especially with our azol fungals. So we do have a practice tool available um, that I would encourage you to download. Um, it has a lot of practical points on managing toxicities um, that can be really helpful. So although um, in our patient, um, gilteritinib is not approved for maintenance therapy, as I mentioned, we thought it was a really reasonable option because she wasn't tolerating serafinib. And um, the data using gilteritinib in the relapsed and refractory um, setting um, is very good. There was a trial called Admiral, and it showed that there was a overall survival benefit using gilteritinib um, over salvage chemotherapy. And that is the, the trial um, for which it, it gained the FDA approval. But it is continuing to be uh, studied in other settings. So we will definitely hear more about that. All right, so let's move on to um, another case. We have Mark, who's a 72-year-old man who presents with AML at, with myelodysplastic changes, and he has a history of hypertension. So Mark is an older patient. He has a high-risk subtype. AML with myelodysplastic changes is considered a secondary AML. So a sec the definition of secondary AMLs are AML with prior myelodysplasia or an AML that has myelodysplastic changes um, on the Bomer exam or treatment-related AML. And these historically are much tougher to treat um, and don't respond as well to chemotherapy. So Mark presented with fatigue, night sweats, and myalgias, um, but he's fit and his functional status is really good. His bone marrow showed 32% blasts and the MDS panel showed a complex karyotype consistent with myelodysplastic changes. So Stephanie, given Mark's functional status, what are the things we think about for his treatment options? So I think whenever we have a patient um, like Mark, who's 72, the sort of the main decision point here is going to be deciding whether he's fit for intensive therapy or whether we're going to have to decide on an alternative option for him. Um, we know that his functional status is good, so we need to consider whether CPX351, which we'll go into a little bit more in the next couple of slides, followed by allogeneic stem cell transplant would be an option for him. If we don't think that he's fit for intensive therapy, um, would we consider using venetoclax plus a hypomethylating agent before transplant? Or while we're still trying to figure out whether or not he's fit enough to undergo a transplant? So what are we going to do um, to help uh, Mark decide which might be the best option for him? So as we think about older patients with AML, um, it's important to look at some of the data that's been done in this population. And really, um, there is good data that shows that older adults can really tolerate intensive therapy. And with this intensive therapy, we may actually even bring about an improvement in their quality of life. One thing we really need to be careful about is age bias when we're treating these patients and making sure that we do not let their, um, their age alone 
determine whether or not they're eligible for intensive therapy. We know that patients with good performance status can potentially benefit from intensive therapy. Um, so really we need to be involving them as well in a discussion of uh, which treatment avenue we decide to pursue. There was a really interesting study looking at quality of life in patients with AML. Looking at patients who received intensive chemotherapy actually had significant improvement in their quality of life scores at one month, where patients who received non-intensive therapy actually had stable quality of life at one month. And what it found that some of the factors that determined quality of life were not actually their, um, their age itself or their functional status going into, trans or going into therapy, but it was actually their leukemia that was impacting their quality of life. So by treating their leukemia with intensive therapy, we actually saw some improvement in their quality of life. Laura, I know that you're familiar with this research. Did you have anything else that you wanted to touch on here? Yeah, I think um, the researchers were really surprised by this. They assumed that the quality of life um, undergoing intensive therapy was going to go down. And I, I think you said it really nicely that we need to keep in mind that when patients are diagnosed, they can be pretty sick from the leukemia. So treating the leukemia can definitely um, make them feel better and improve their functional status. And it's really important um, to remember this, especially as we're evaluating patients for different therapies um, at different time intervals. So there's the time of diagnosis, there's a time after induction therapy, what kind of post-remission therapy, and then whether or not they can tolerate um, a transplant or whether or not they should do any sort of maintenance therapy. So we need to constantly be reevaluating where they're at. And conversely, there are some patients that undergo intensive therapy and they have a lot of complications and they're no longer a uh, candidate for a transplant. And we need to think about other post-remission therapies that um, that they can tolerate and that would be helpful for them. Thanks. So we're gonna talk now a little bit about CPX351 or Vixios is the other name for this drug um, as an established option for patients who do have high risk AML. So CPX351 is a liposomal formulation of cytarabine and donorubicin in a five to one molar ratio of cytarabine to donorubicin. This is approved for both adult and pediatric patients with treatment-related AML or AML with myelodysplastic-related changes. Um, it's important to know that this is often used as an induction regimen, but can also be given as a consolidation regimen. And with consolidation, it's just given on days one and three only. So in, tri in clinical trials, when CPX351 was compared with 7 plus 3, um, it was found to have less GI side effects, mucositis, and hair loss, lower 30 and 60 day mortality, improvement in achieving a complete remission and overall survival. Um, but it also had some prolonged neutropenia and thrombocytopenia that we really need to be aware of when we're talking to patients. Um, also, it's important to remember that this still includes an anthracycline dose, so we need to be mindful of how much anthracycline the patients have received. And that even though this is a novel therapy and it's different than 7 plus 3, this is still considered an intensive chemotherapy in patients who are, who are fit for this type of therapy. Although it's an intensive therapy, one of the nice things about it, right, is that we can administer it outpatient in certain patients. And I think a lot of centers are exploring that um, as a potential option uh, for out, outpatient therapy. Correct. So a lot of our patients are receiving um, the actual chemotherapy itself as an outpatient, and then they're being admitted um, throughout their nadir when they're sort of uh, having most of their side effects and really receiving most of their transfusions. So in sort of busy medical centers like ours, whenever you can save even a couple of days of hospitalization beds, um, that certainly is a benefit and the patients enjoy being at home for as much time as possible as well. So here's just a quick look at some of the data looking at, um, the, this is a five-year update, looking at CPX351 versus 7 plus 3 in patients with high-risk or secondary AML. And you can see both in the curve that's looking at survival from their time of randomization on the left and from the time of transplant on the right, that there really were um, um, benefits to each group that received Vixios, 
And I think that the take home point in this slide is really that the patients, uh, that a large number of patients who received uh, CPX351 were able to get to allogeneic stem cell transplant. And then the patients that did get to allogeneic stem cell transplant actually had um, a pretty good survival rate over the patients who had not received the CPX351 upfront in therapy. Um, so I think this transplant data is really particularly encouraging. Okay, so that brings us back to Mark, who again is our fit 72-year-old man with uh, AML with myelodysplastic changes, who's now in a CER after uh, CPX351 uh, induction therapy. We know that he's fit. He's got a, a, his past medical history is only significant for hypertension, and he's got a good performance status even after completing induction and consolidation. So now we're starting to think about what do we want to do next for Mark? Laura, do you have any thoughts here? There are so many options now for post-remission therapy. So the NCCN lists, um, there's a whole list of post-remission and maintenance options. Uh, there's allogeneic transplant, there's chemotherapy, there's hypomethylating agents. Um, and so for Mark, who um, has had intensive therapy, um, we need to really present all of these options to him. Now he's 72 years old and historically, uh, we didn't perform allogeneic transplants in patients who were over the age of 60. But that has really changed as we started to focus on, um, on uh, physiolo physiologic age rather than chronologic age. And so there um, now are reduced intensity allogeneic transplantation approaches that have shown to be a viable option for patients who are over than age 60. And so I think this is definitely an option that we would discuss with Mark. Um, and then there's also the option of oral azacitidine. And this is something um, that is a novel agent that was recently approved. And maybe Stephanie, you can kind of walk us through um, that option. Yeah, as I think we start to become more comfortable with transplant being an option for some of these patients, it sort of leaves us um, to think about the other group of patients who may not be fit for transplant and what is the best option for them. We wanted to talk about oral azacitidine here as a, as a new maintenance option. Um, this was uh, approved recently. And this really that looking at oral ASA maintenance improved overall survival versus placebo um, in, the, in a, the trial that was called Quasar. Um, so this was FDA approved for the continued treatment of patients with AML in their first CR who were unable to complete intensive curative therapy for whatever reason. So this is for patients who are not able to, com uh, to complete uh, high dose cytarabine uh, uh, consolidation therapy or consolidate, consolidation therapy with CPX351. And this did, was showed, uh, shown that the oral ASA reduced the risk of death by 30% and the risk of relapse by 41% versus placebo, really independent of their baseline characteristics. And one thing that I think the oral azacitidine is really going to be a big deal for is that we know that many of our patients are able to tolerate um, some of the hypomethylating agents right now but the reality about um, sort of currently available sub-Q or IV hypomethylating agents is that it ends up being a lot of time in clinic for a lot of these patients, um, particularly when these drugs are given um, until their disease progresses. So really being able to look at uh, oral hypomethylating agents like oral azacitidine, I think is going to be a great option for some of our older patients who can't tolerate um, more intensive therapy. So just sort of a practical summary, what does oral ASA maintenance actually look like? So the dose is 300 milligrams daily for 14 days of a 28 day cycle. So this is different than how we give IV or sub-Q azacitidine. So that's important to know. Um, and that GI events were predominantly noted during the first true two treatment cycles. So really we should be educating these patients on how that they should be taking their antiemetics during their first two cycles and making sure that we're telling them how to take their antiemetics during the first two cycles. And the most common grade three or four adverse events were or, uh, cytopenias, particularly neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, which is not surprising given what we know about other formulations of this drug.
So for patients that were getting ready to start oral azacitidine therapy, I think we need to be prepared to discuss um, sort of principles of good oral therapy and, um, and good adherence, which I think we're all becoming more familiar with as more chemotherapeutic agents are coming out in oral formulations, really making sure that these patients feel um, both comfortable taking their chemotherapy at home and knowing the importance of good adherence to these drugs. Um, I think we also know that the better that we teach patients, or the, the better we are at teaching patients to manage their side effects, the greater the chance that they're going to be adherent to these drugs. So really being vigilant about making sure that these patients understand how to manage their, um, their GI toxicity at home, particularly nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, and making sure that these patients have a good contact number that they can reach their, um, their clinic if they're having trouble taking these medications. Again, um, we put together a practice tool that you're able to download at this point about managing some of these side effects that we might see with um, the oral azacitidine. And we're gonna sort of extrapolate a little bit since we're talking about oral azacitidine that there is also um, a room for people to talk, for patients to receive post-transplant ma maintenance with hypomethylating agents. And that um, there is uh, not conclusive data, but, da but data that does show that receiving a hypomethylating agents post-transplant can be uh, very safe and that some patients may actually benefit in this setting. I think that the oral azacitidine is going to become a player in this setting. Um, there was a small study that, that was done that showed that it was well tolerated with low rates of relapse disease progression in GVHD. There are other studies that have looked at um, sort of conventional azacitidine and decitabine that they show that this may be a good option for patients um, post hematopoietic stem cell transplant who are at higher risk of relapse. Let's consider a slightly different scenario. What if Mark was older with comorbid illnesses and not a candidate for intensive um, therapy? So now uh, we have a situation where the comorbid illnesses include COPD and hypertension. Um, he's a little more frail. He's having fatigue, night sweats and myalgias. Performance status is a little um, bit worse. And um, the bone marrow shows 32% blast and a complex karyotype. So in this situation, um, Stephanie, given his functional status, um, how would you counsel him on less intensive options to treat this leukemia? So I think here is the point in this talk that we really get to talk um, a bit about venetoclax and how the VLA trial really significantly changed the landscape for treating older, more frail patients um, who were diagnosed with AML. So, this was sort of a, um, a landmark study that showed that this combination of venetoclax plus azacitidine did improve overall survival compared to azacitidine alone in older patients. It led to statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement in both response rates and overall survival compared with aza alone. Um, so this has really been a big news for our older, more for all patients um, because it's really been the first significant therapy that has shown a good survival benefit from them um, in a very long time. In terms of safety and whether patients were able to tolerate it, this is generally a well-tolerated regimen with notable um, adverse effects, including uh, neutropenia and pneumonias. Um, and we are gonna talk a little bit about tumor lysis syndrome, but on this data, the, uh, on this trial, the uh, prevalence of the tumor, tumor lysis syndrome was actually pretty low. Yeah, we got lucky because venetoclax was studied previously in CLL and they observed tumor lysis and learned how to put in preventive measures. So by the time it was studied in AML, they knew to have preventive measures so we don't see, really see tumor lysis with this drug. Right. So um, in talking a little bit about how we're going to educate our patients who are starting on venetoclax, what, are we, what is important for us as nurses to really make sure that they go home understanding? I think it, the big thing for patients to understand is this is a drug that is going to cause significant cytopenias. So pe people should really be prepared for that. Um, and really it can cause neutropenia, anemia, and thrombocytopenia. This drug can have some GI toxicity, so patients should be prepared um, and know what to do in case they develop nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Um, 
these patients do report significant fatigue on this, um, on this drug. And we are gonna talk a little bit more about some of the drug interactions, which are important to be aware of when we're re reviewing medications with patients. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the risk of tumor lysis syndrome, and then with any um, oral regimen, um, making sure that patients really understand the importance of adherence. So the ramp up is really what we're doing with venetoclax now in order to decrease the risk of patients developing tumor lysis syndrome. And really it works just as you can see here, that on day one, patients are going to start at a dose of 100 milligrams. And then over the next couple of days, they're going to ramp up to a goal dose of 400 milligrams. And this slow ramp up is really effective at decreasing their risk of tumor lysis syndrome. Um, a couple of just practical points for patients to know is that it's recommended that venetoclax be taken 30 minutes after a meal with water um, and that patients um, really should be continuing their venetoclax in combination with their hypomethylating agent um, until disease progression or until unacceptable toxicity is reached. And again, there's another tool here you'll be able to link on for some help in figuring out, um, working through some of the side effects and the dose ramp up. So in order to prevent tumor lysis syndrome, what are we going to do with these patients? Here's a real, sort of a nice flow chart to walk us through it. We'd like patients to be, um, to have a total white blood cell count less than 25 prior to initiation with venetoclax. And if they don't, you may want to consider a cytoreduction reduction um, prior to them starting the agent. We wanna look at each individual patient risk, what, how many, uh, what their total white blood, cell, white, white blood cell count is, what percentage of that is circulating blasts, um, and whether these patients have a decreased renal function that might put them at higher risk um, for tumor lysis syndrome. Making sure that before these patients start, they have a complete metabolic panel done so we know what their potassium, their uric acid, phosphorus, and calcium are prior to starting the dose. And these are patients that need to have these, um, uh, their complete metabolic panels monitored fairly closely after starting the venetoclax. These are patients that we also need to make sure are able to take in adequate hydration at home. And we should uh, be using uh, anti-hyperuricemic agents such as allopurinol prior to the first dose of venetoclax. And they really should be staying on allopurinol through their ramp up phase. The myelosuppression is also a, a particular concern with venetoclax as it can be um, quite hard on people's blood counts. Obviously, these patients are going to be, need to be transfused as needed, and we need to consider antimicrobial prophylaxis when these patients are neutropenic. Um, I think sort of key points here is that if patients are very neutropenic, neutropenic, prior to achieving a complete response, we should not be interrupting their treatment cycles. If they are in a complete remission, then we can go ahead and delay their next cycle until their ANC is above 500 and platelets are greater than 25,000 or up to 14 days. These patients who are in CR can receive growth factor in order to aid in count recovery um, prior to starting their next cycle of treatment. This is a drug um, that can be uh, finessed a bit um, in terms of patients who do experience significant neutropenic events. We can reduce the venetoclax to 21 days of a 28 day cycle in order to um, promote count recovery prior to starting their next cycle of therapy. This is also a drug with significant drug-to-drug -drug interactions, um, which are easily managed, but you really need to be aware of what else is on their med list when you're starting their, uh, when they're starting venetoclax, um, particularly posico posiconazole and voriconazole. With posiconazole, you can see there is an adjusted dose ramp up below to reach a goal dose of 70 milligrams daily. And voriconazole, again, it's not quite as much, but the goal dose is going to be 100 milligrams daily with an adjusted ramp up as well. In terms of uh, moderate uh, 3A4 and PGP inhibitors, we're gonna decrease the venetoclax dose by at least 50%. And then in cases where the patients actually have a discontinuation of their interacting medication, they need about two to three days before they can resume the standard dose of venetoclax. And just one more point that I want to make about um, the drug-to-drug -drug interactions. I think, um, A, it's important, um, and we really benefit from uh, having an on-site pharmacist who helps us with a lot of our drug-to-drug -drug interactions, but important not only when you're starting therapy, 
but a lot of these patients may be having their other medications adjusted while they're on their venetoclax. And while you're changing other medications, it's important to make sure that you're not um, inadvertently starting or stopping something that's going to have a significant interaction with their venetoclax. That's a really good point, Stephanie. I also have really appreciated our pharmacist's um, role in reviewing all of the medications and helping with some of the patient education for these uh, oral medications, especially because there are so many drug-to-drug -drug interactions. And sometimes patients are taking medications over the counter or supplements that um, they didn't realize that uh, we also wanted to hear about because they don't consider them medications. So you, that was a really nice summary of um, some of the, the practical points of treating patients um, on venetoclax um, in combination with a hypomethylating agent. Um, so venetoclax and, and hypomethylating methylating agents really have become now the workhorse of leukemia treatment. Um, it has been an incredible shift um, and it's very beneficial for so many of our patients and we've been using it quite a bit. So it's really the optimal approach for newly diagnosed AML that's not suitable for intensive therapy and that's irrespective of cytogenetic or molecular features. Um, they did some subgroup analysis of the Viali A trial and they showed that even when patients had cytogenetic or molecular abnormalities like IDH1, or IDH2, they still benefited more from the combination of venetoclax and a hypomethylating agent than from using a, um, a targeted uh, agent as monotherapy. Um, so this regimen is generally well tolerated. The 30-day mortality is only about 6 to 7%, which is low compared to intensive chemotherapy. Um, there is prolonged uh, neutropenia compared with using a hypomethylating agent alone, but using the combination has significantly greater um, effectiveness. Um, and we see responses uh, pretty quick. The median time to response is, is only about one month. Um, the drawback to this is that therapy is indefinite, so patients do continue um, on, on therapy um, indefinitely. Now that we have so many novel agents, um, in the future we expect that we're going to see um, more studies released looking at combination of these different agents. So for example, using ibocitinib in combination with azacitidine or venetoclax um, or enacitinib in combination with these um, or liposomal cytarabine and donorubicin in combination with uh, FLT3 inhibitors. And these studies are already starting to be done. Um, one of really interesting uh, clinical trial that's ongoing right now is evaluating the combination with uh, liposomal cytarabine and donorubicin, otherwise known as CPX351. That was its, its study name. And this study is looking to see if liposomal donorubicin and cytarabine can be safely combined with agents such as venetoclax or targeted agents like mitostorin against split-3 and um, anacitinib against um, IDH2. So patients are going to be stratified according to specific molecular um, mutations um, and you know there are several different arms in this trial to see which uh, combinations with liposomal cytarabine and donorubicin are safe and beneficial. Another really interesting trial that is going on right now is looking at uh, venetoclax in combination with gilteritinib for relapse refractory uh, FLT3 mutated AML. And the initial results of this trial um, showed that it was safe and it was effective. Um, so there will definitely be more to come on this. This was just released in abstract form, and there are certainly other ongoing trials looking at these really important combinations. In summary, Stephanie and I would really like to thank you for joining us today for this presentation on AML. Hematology oncology nurse professionals have such a vital role in educating patients and supporting them through their emotional journey um, through diagnosis and treatment uh, for AML. Nurses are really on the front lines of care and are there to explain what the tests mean, the different types of AML, the different treatment options, and how we best manage the symptoms. And with that kind of care and support,
um, patients definitely do better and live longer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash ESW860. This activity is supported through educational grants from Astellas and Bristol-Myers Squibb.